I'm going to sit here and introduce you here. Okay. Okay. Oh, do I do I face you? Well, it doesn't matter. You oh, can. yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Today is 23 February, the year 2004. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with special guest, Iris Carmel. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sergeant Bernard Sergio. Sergeant Sergio was in the Army in New Guinea and other areas of the Pacific in World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Bernard. Fine, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Would you please uh, spell your full name for us? S-U-R-G-I-L, pronounced Sergil. And when and where were you born? I was born in New York City in 1925. And the date? August 10th. Okay. And um, what was your father's name? William. And what did he do? He was in the dry cleaning business in New York City. And how did he uh, get there? How did, where did your ancestors come from? Well, he was actually in the German army in World War I, and uh, due to anti-Semitic uh, behavior by his fellow soldiers, he deserted during the First World War, walked to the Netherlands, got on board, uh, smuggled himself on board a Canadian ship, wound up in Montreal, smuggled ashore, and got a job of some kind, probably labor, because he had no money or didn't know the language. And ultimately, uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, had enough money to buy a tuxedo and a high hat and made out he was a drunken reveler and walked across the International Bridge and got into the United States and walked down to New York City because he had heard there were gold in the streets. And, uh, and so that's how he got to New York. And ultimately, I think Congress passed a law uh, that people of his ilk uh, could apply for citizenship and stay in the country. And so that's my father's background. Oh my was, was he in France when, uh, during World War One? Yeah, I guess at the German-French border, yes, on the German side. Yes. yes. Had he gotten into uh, Some any combat? fighting? Or, yeah, combat he was uh, rather reticent to talk about his experiences. So uh, I would assume that he didn't see too much combat. Okay. And your mother, what was her uh, maiden name, her full um, name? Her name was Lillian Rosen, and she was born in the Lowlands, uh, and her father was a brewery salesman for an English company, and had gone to, I guess, a sales meeting. I'm elaborating on this because the details okay, the are the Lowlands sketchy. where? Uh, Holland. Okay. And, um, uh, I'm assuming he went to a sales meeting and World War I broke out and he couldn't get back. And um, my maternal grandmother was killed during the First World War, I, I assume shelling or something. And my mother wound up in an orphanage. My grandfather married an English woman, Cockney, who was really my grandmother as far as I was concerned. And they emigrated to New York after the First World War and brought my mother over. And then in New York, at some point, my parents met and married, and I'm one-third of the results of that marriage. And uh, uh, you say Cockney. Do you remember your grandmother with the Cockney accent? Oh, yeah. She used to say to me, how are you, Bernard? <laughs> and I like that. And she was a piano teacher, and I was really very, very fond of her. And so you had brothers and sisters? I have two sisters. And what were their names? Um, my... Um, one sister's name is Rita, and one is Marilyn. And um, my sister Rita lives in Baltimore. My sister Marilyn lives in Manhattan. And uh, you, I think you probably grew up during the Depression. What was that like for you and your family? Yeah, it was uh, interesting to see this country as I only could remember it then. Uh, I remember having to go with my father on Sunday to the bakery because he spent a dollar 
and uh, for the dollar, if I recall correctly, we got 13 rolls, a rye bread, uh, and several cakes. And when the baker saw my father coming, he opened the door for him because he spent a dollar. And I had to help him carry home the bakery products. So that, and I remember men standing under the subway selling apples. Um, but I was really too young at being born in 1925 to get the impact of the Depression. Um, I have a sense of it, but I, men who were born in 1920 uh, were really strongly imprinted. And psychologically, I, it carried with them throughout their lives. They generally felt poor. I've always been fortunate enough, I've always felt rich, although I, it has nothing to do with the amount of money. Did uh, your dad was able to work all during those he, days? He worked, yes, and probably made, I'm going to guess, $50, $60 a week, which was a lot of money. And what did you say that he, he was doing? He was in the dry cleaning business. Actually, he had a truck, and he picked up dirty clothing from a, a cleaning store. In those days, they didn't have self-cleaning units within individual stores and would bring it to a factory, get it clean, and then bring it back. And the cost that he was charged and what he charged the store, I guess, was his profit differential. And so that's how we earned a living. Never thought about that so much, but do you know when dry cleaning came into existence, when, when the techniques became available to I people? I would say uh, probably followed historically the beginning of the 20th century when there was a great migration to the cities from the farms and the European migration after the First World War. People got into the city and it became important to have clean clothing and living in tenements and other buildings of that ilk uh, probably facilitated that type of business. Yeah, well, what I'm getting at is uh, there's certain kind of clothes that you have to dry clean. You can't just wash with soap and water. Is that oh, not correct? Well, in those days, wool was and cotton were the two textile fibers. Nylon, rayon, and any other synthetics were not in existence yet. They weren't developed mostly by DuPont until the 1920s and popularized in the 1930s. So that dry cleaning of a man's uh, suit, and I'm omitting silk. Silk was also used for women's dresses and so forth. So that's probably how the industry developed. It's a good question. I never really thought it through. I'm doing this on the cuff here. <laughs> okay. Um, and in dry cleaning, did, did, you, did you help out in the um, or anything like that? One summer. And, so what's uh, the fluids? What do they use? What do uh, they use? They use benzene of some kind, and it smelled awful. And my mother ultimately uh, prevailed upon my father to not allow me to go to work. Uh, so I didn't. I became a piano player and worked in bands in the Catskill Mountains during the summers. So when did you start taking piano lessons? I must have been about nine years old. And did you take to it right away, or did you um, like it? Or not? not at the beginning. I didn't like. Yes, I took to it, but I didn't like practicing. Uh, but as I got, when I was about ten years old, I realized there was something in this that really appealed to me, and um, something switched in my mind, and I took to practicing. And then when I switched to playing jazz, that really became inspirational, and uh, so I became a piano player. Did you, um, what did your kids do for recreation when you were growing up? <clears throat> we lived in New York, and so we played on the streets. Uh, something called stoop ball, which um, meant there was a set of stairs, which had a sharp projection as each level step, and you had a ball and you threw it against the steps, and of course, um, how many bounces was how many bases, so you could uh, get a single or double. And if you hit the point of the step, usually the projection was really high and far, and that was deemed to be a home run. So that was one game. We played Monopoly and um, pick up sticks, um, Parcheesi, a lot of uh, indoor games too. That, uh, that reminds me, uh, your stoop ball. I lived out in the country in Indiana, and like a mile away from any kid, so, and I uh, basically was, I didn't have any brother, I had one young sister, but, so, and I love sports and baseball in particular, and we had a, a, a porch, and there was like three steps, like right. that, 
out in our front lawn, and uh, I'd play by myself with a, it was like a hard rubber ball, and I'd throw it, and it depending, as you know, whichever you, the ball might pop up, sure. or it might come as a ground ball, or it might come as a yes. line drive, and I would play nine innings, and I had an American League team, oh. National League team, and just play for hours and hours, you know. And, that's Chase wonderful. The ball down. So, yeah, so, children are very inventive. Can, that's, I mean, aren't we? all these kind of things that you buy for kids now, and I noticed with our grandkids, you give them a couple little sticks or something, and they'll spend just as much sure. time with that Absolutely. as anything else. You know. yeah. um, so, where did, what was what was the address? Where did you live in New York? Uh, I lived on um, Fenton Avenue. And where was that? That was in the Bronx, off of Boston Post Road. And it was somewhat rural. Um, during the Depression, the unused land, although it belonged to someone, was usually cultivated into a little truck farm, um, mainly by the Italians. They were very efficient in growing things in rocky city soil. And uh, so that's, that's where I grew up. And it was a wholesome area. You, Never locked your car, or if you were lucky enough to afford a car, which wasn't so, and uh, your apartment, and people in the neighborhood related to one another. Um, it became different society after the Second World War. Excuse me. <coughs> Did you follow the New York uh, sports teams? Yes, I became a New York Giant fan. Uh, Carl Hubble was a favorite pitcher, and Mel Ott was a favorite hitter. And Dizzy Dean, when he came in, uh, we didn't have a lot of money to go to a baseball game, but my father did take me to Polo Grounds uh, to see Carl Hubble pitch against Dizzy Dean. It was the first baseball game I ever saw, and uh, the Cardinals won one nothing. It was really a pitcher's duel, and it was an exciting game, and I remember that. I think I must have been maybe nine. Hubble was a knuckleball pitcher, wasn't he? I, I, I think so. He yes. was masterful, yeah. and as, as was Dizzy Dean. Oh, yeah. So that was an experience. I was in the Midwest. Yeah. I was a big Cardinal fan. So oh, were you? Right. Um, so where did you go to grade school, grammar school? Uh, I went to a PS, some number I don't remember. A friend of mine would probably remember the number. And then I went to Evander Childs High School, which was the community high school. And uh, when I graduated, I went to New York University. Was, was your family very religious when you were growing up? No. As a matter of fact, not at all. Um, and although I dabbled in it for a few months, um, I found out that I could find uh, my spirituality and other elements in that ilk um, other than the um, structured religious environment that was open to me. Uh, tell me a little, a little bit more about your piano uh, uh, ventures. Well, I was uh, 14 years old, and I was a pretty good jazz piano player. Uh, I listened to the radio quite a bit, and they used to have something called the Make Believe Ballroom. It was in New York City. <coughs> So you would hear all the contemporary music. Um, I don't recall if I had a record player at that time. I don't think we did. It was too expensive. Uh, but you could listen to the radio and hear the contemporary music. Which was? Uh, was all the big bands, basically. Or I became more interested in the New Orleans uh, music of the late 1920s and early 30s. Uh, Fat Swaller and Jelly Roll Morton and... Um, people of that ilk, and uh, learned how to play chords, read guitar chords, which gave me a good opportunity to improvise. And also, if there were um, scores given to you, they usually had that, and you could sight read quite well with that kind of technique. And um, one summer, when I was almost 14, uh, I went to a music store to buy some sheet music. And the owner of the store said to me, is this for you? And I said, yes. Do you play the piano? I said, yes. He says, there's a band down the street in the basement practicing, and they need a piano player. Anyhow, to make a long story short, I went down, and their piano player had an appendix attack and 
they had a job up in the Catskill Mountains. And so I uh, played and they said, come with us. And the pay was $7 a week plus room and board for 10 weeks. And of course, I hadn't told my parents, my mother mainly, she was the dominant factor in the house, that I had already agreed to take the job. And I was scared to death she wouldn't let me go. And when I told her that uh, I had taken the job, she uh, said, you can't go. You're too young to go away. The, the men were 18 and 19. And so it was vast. But I was almost six foot tall by the time I was 14 and was somewhat sophisticated. So I could pass for an older age. Anyhow, to make a long story short, my father rescued me and prevailed upon my mother to allow me to go. And I went. And that was the beginning of being independent for me. I saw I could earn money. I saw I had the ability to uh, live in the male world without any problems. Or if there were, I knew how to handle them or learned how to handle them. And so that was the beginning of my independence and breaking away from my family. The, uh, was, that kind of, was that a jazz band? Yes. Or were there any blacks in the band? No, um, there were no blacks. Um, in New York City in the 1930s, I remember going to elementary school, and there were probably a half a dozen black children who sat in the last row of the class, who never participated in asking any question. <coughs> Excuse me. Nor would they ask any. And I look back at the sadness of, of that. The, uh, the the white culture who totally didn't see black people, except as maids or laborers. And uh, it's been a slow process, but fortunately, it is changing. And um, I spent time at uh, COD, and I observed the children, the young people. And there is a honest mixing now of uh, as equals as friends and so forth, and that's very encouraging to me. Right. Did you go to, uh, I guess, was it Harlem where they, uh, the book, sure. all, all that? Yeah, Did you the get, Cotton get Club oh, and yeah. Smalls on Lenox Avenue. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, in reverse, the black people always welcomed the white people uh, with great hospitality, uh, contrary to the white culture. If you went down to Harlem and uh, were not um, inappropriate in any way, you were welcomed into the taverns or the bars or down the street, you know. Um, it was an interesting phenomenon to see the uh, different cultures, the cruelty of the white culture and the uh, more open approach that the black people had. What year did you graduate from high school? Um, Oh, if you ask me, dates, I think 1942. Okay, so, well, okay, let's, let's go back just a little bit. Do you remember what you were doing on December 7th, 1941? Yes, I do. I was in high school. I was a senior in high school, I guess, yes. And I was listening to the radio, and it was 6 o'clock at night, and I was home alone studying, and I heard about Pearl Harbor on the radio, and I was devastated that the war would be over before I could go. I remember that was my first reaction. And when my parents came home, I asked if I could volunteer. And they said no. Uh, my mother really said no. <laughs> um, so there was nothing I could do. Was that, could you see war coming? Were you guys learning anything about it in school? What was going on in Europe, <coughs> in the Far East and stuff? No, uh, but I was interested in current events. And I remember when they cut down the Third Avenue L, the steel of that uh, trellis and the tracks, and remember reading that they were selling it to Japan and knowing that Japan had invaded China, uh, the famous Shanghai pictures of that little orphan girl sitting in the railroad station. I, I was sensitive to that and wondered why we were doing that. That seemed to me to be foolish. Um, I hadn't really thought about your question for so long, but I did have an awareness that there was something rotten in Denmark, to quote Hamlet. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, but Pearl Harbor was a shock of the like it was to everyone. So <clears throat> you continued on with high school. Yes. And you graduated in? In 42, the right. year after okay, Pearl so Harbor. June or whatever. So what did you do after you graduated? Well, I, I, I went to New York University 
um, and enrolled in a pre-med course at New York University and uh, joined the ROTC and um, at 18, and how, why did you uh, go into pre-med? What was your uh, goal? Well, I thought I wanted to do that. Uh, then uh, mostly it was the pressure from my mother. Uh, <laughs> One of the doctor in the Well, family. the uh, Jewish boy should be the first doctor, and if you couldn't do that, a dentist. And if you failed at that, you'd be a lawyer. So uh, uh, might as well go for the bullseye. <laughs> right. So... Um, but you were still doing your uh, your music on the side. Yes, yes, yes. I did that until I went into the army. Yes. Okay. So you're okay. Well, well, let's kind of carry along. You go into your pre med in NYU, the right. Violets, right? Yes. Oh, good for you. <laughs> they had good basketball teams in those days, didn't yes. they? Yes. Yes. Dolph Shays. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so then, how is it that you ended up in the service? Well, at 18, you had to register with the draft board. And I was pre-med. I could have gotten an exemption. Uh, but I went to the draft board and I said, I want to go immediately. And I remember they were surprised because most boys didn't say that. Um, and, and why did you say that? What was I your wanted thoughts? to serve. I really wanted to get into the war to fight for my country. Um, did you have any buddies or, or friends that felt this way? Or what did you, did you have any close friends uh, growing up? No. Did you have a girlfriend at that time? I had girlfriends, yes. Uh, Iris Carmel, the lady who brought me here, was a girlfriend of mine. And uh, that's a whole story unto itself. Okay. She didn't look like that then. <laughs> she looks pretty good to I me. I look better now. I see. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I just think I had a... Patriotism that was very strong. My family was patriotic, my mother especially. I think having European parents who lived through the First World War and the sense of oppression and no freedom. I remember my mother telling me how remarkable it was. You could go from New York State to New Jersey and you didn't need a passport. Uh, whereas in Europe, of course, every country required you to stop at the border. So I think in that sense, uh, I was inculcated with a uh, element of patriotism that perhaps wasn't as prevalent in people born here from parents born here. Iris, would you take a seat over there for a moment, please? Oh, dear. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, what, was your, uh, what was your name, uh, your last name in those days? It was Haida, H-A-I-D-A. -A. My father was Czech born. Oh, really? And strangely enough, that name though being a Czech name, also is a Canadian Indian tribe. Oh, The yeah. Haida Indians. Uh -huh. And when did you, was your father born over in Czechoslovakia? Yes. Oh, okay, and how did he get to the United States? Uh, pursuing my mother, who was also born in Austria, uh, though they met during, I, I guess, yes, they met during the First World War. She was a refugee from Austria to Czechoslovakia, which was meant walking across the border at that time. Many uh, Jewish intermarriages happened in that area because of that situation. Anyhow, after the war, she came here where her mother and sister already were, leaving behind a father and a brother, I believe. And my father followed her. Married here, I was born here. Your father was Jewish, but she was no, not? No, my father's Catholic, my oh. mother was Jewish. Oh, the other way, yeah, I see. Yeah. But um, that never was a problem, at least in our house. I was raised with both religions or none, whichever way you wanted to look at it. Okay. And uh, when did you meet this gentleman here? I met him when we were, uh, we, we argue about that because this is the second time around, youth and old age. Uh, I think we were about 15, well he's a year older. Uh, 15 and 16, went together for about two years, but this is an you, argument between us oh, we're on our dates. You had gone to the same high school? Is no, that, no, no. Oh. We met through mutual friends and liked each other, and that was a childhood romance. 
then he can tell you another part of the story as his story. Well, we'll get into that. Um, tell me a little bit about when we're, what you were doing on December 7th, if you can recall. Actually, I, I, outside of being in shock and remembering the shock, I don't think I was totally aware of what had happened. Uh, just the excitement of having uh, been invaded or bombed or whatever it was. I really can't tell you exactly where I was, though so I was in high school at the time. After that, I remember spending a lot of time knitting. Knitting for Britain, I think it was called, or something. Never that's could... why we almost lost the war. That's right. <laughs> and, and all those soldiers didn't have heels on their socks, because they couldn't make the turn. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember all during the war years, what you and your family were doing? Actually, we were we stayed put. My, my father and mother both worked for the war effort as volunteers. My father was in the display business and did a lot of publicity for them. My mother was a, I don't remember what you called it at that time. She had a uniform and, oh, bonds for, yeah, she sold bonds. Okay. That was it. Oh, I, I don't remember a lot of this either. It's interesting <laughs> yeah. to bring that back. Yeah. And uh, I have pictures of them in those years. Uh, my mother in her uniform and my father with placards and so on. Yeah. And I just went through high school knitting. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time you well, by the time you went into the service, you two were not an item any longer. Is that fair no, to say? No, we were. Oh, you were. We were. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're still going together. Then. You want to go into that? Well. Yeah. Go ahead. This is good. Go on. You well, go. I I was overseas in the Philip. I think in Lady in the Philippine Islands. No, I know I was there and. Mail was sometimes three, four months delayed, and I remember receiving a Dear John letter from her at that point, which was quite, uh, well, it was, uh, I took it very hard. It was uh, difficult to receive that kind of letter under the circumstances, and uh, I try to get revenge for that every day now. <laughs> I must tell you at that point that up until this, our second time around, 60 years later, or 50 years later, I don't know uh, how much, I m found out that my mother had sent him a letter after I sent him that letter apologizing for my behavior because she just didn't do that. But I was all of 17 years old and not, not willing to be tied down and mm. that was my story. Yeah. He has gotten revenge. <laughs> 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 and you've, you've been properly sorry ever since then. Yes. Huh? Okay. Well, the interesting thing was we remained friends throughout our life. We uh, knew people and uh, uh, had different occasions to go to weddings and funerals, etc. And so we always saw each other uh, periodically for our whole lives. And then we both married other people. And, uh, and then, uh, as uh, she just said, so we got together later in life, right. and uh, it's been fine. Okay. okay, well, let's continue on yet with, uh, uh, tell me, um, okay, you went down to the draft board and and, and, yeah, and, and and a month later, I was in the Army, and my mother was all perplexed. How could that happen if you were pre-med? I never told her. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I wound up in Fort Dix, <coughs> excuse me. That's in New Jersey? Yeah, uh, for about a week, I think, was the processing. And then wound up at being shipped to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in uh, part of the 101st Airborne, uh, in the gliders. Uh, but as it turned out, fortunately, by the time I got there, the Army decided not to do that anymore because they would put a 105 millimeter howitzer in a glider with a crew, and usually when the glider hit the ground, the howitzer broke loose and crushed and killed the soldiers. So after X number of times, and I really don't know that, but it, they changed it, and uh, we became field artillery. And that's when I joined the outfit, as a, as a replacement for someone who had been killed. What outfit was that? The 465th Field Artillery Battalion, yes. Um, and, and so what, was your, what was your training like for that? It uh, was basic training, uh, 16 weeks, I believe. It was 
I was 18. And you were <coughs> still at Bragg? Pardon were, me? Were you still at Fort Bragg? At Fort Bragg, right. Okay. Yes, and uh, it was a fabulous training. When I got through with it, I never have felt stronger in my life. Um, we did uh, five mile runs in the rain. We did 10 mile hikes full pack, uh, bivouacked out in the pine forest in the snowstorms, although I wound up in the South Pacific, but it was training. 100 push ups before breakfast. Uh, but if you were old, you couldn't do it. Like old, I mean 24, 25. Men 24, 25 couldn't do that. It was really a young man's war. And even overseas, uh, those who made basic training and were shipped overseas uh, didn't last long in combat, in the jungles. It was too difficult for people raised in the temperate zone to live in the torrid zone. Yeah. So, um, okay, where did you go from Fort Bragg then? Fort Bragg to New Orleans uh, for about two weeks and shipped out via the Panama Canal. You um, Did the people know you were Jewish? Did your fellow soldiers yes. know? Did you have any problems with that? Uh, not until towards the end of the war. Um, what I, the outfit was mostly from New England, uh, blue-collar kids. Um, there was a difference. I had a level of awareness and sensitivity. Um, that I noticed was not common among my fellow soldiers. Um, they, I, I was all, I would always stayed a civilian who became a good soldier. Uh, these boys were brutal soldiers. Uh, I saw a difference. Uh, I don't know what happened to their humanity, as it seemed to me. Um, in any event, that was. The deck of cards. This was even before they saw the atrocities and things no. the Japanese were No, oh, I would say not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They were mill workers or fishing people from Boston area, Rhode Island, some Connecticut. Um, young, 18, 19, 20. I was probably the youngest one in the outfit, but maybe by six months. And I would say the average age was about 19 to 20. In that outfit. Okay, so, uh, and you're, you're having artillery training in yes. New Orleans. What's Field that? artillery and a 155 millimeter howitzer, powerful gun. Talk a little bit about, tell me a little bit well, about that. Well, it uh, had a range of about 20 to 22 miles, uh, high, pro high trajectory. Um, you had a two part loading, uh, first the shell on a tray, because it weighed about 200 pounds, and then the power pack funny, I'm remembering all of this now, behind it, and then slam the door, lock it, and um, go through the sighting device and get your coordinates uh, from the forward ob observer, either a uh, little Cessna or ground, <clears throat> and I did some of that. And then you fired it with a tremendous explosion. You turned your back, but my hearing losses are, of course, attributed to, uh, to that uh, constant explosion. Uh, earplugs? Uh, no, they didn't supply them then. Yeah. And uh, what was the range? The range was about 20 to 22 miles. And how large was the projectile? Uh, uh, in size, I would say probably three and a half feet to four feet. Then you uh, fused in the uh, nose cone. You screwed in the nose cone, pulled a pin out, pushed it in with a lanyard. No, a lanyard was what you pulled. with. I forget the term of the stick right. that you Just used, like uh, and then and then the powder. And how big of a was it like a satchel, a thing, a thing of powder, a sack of powder, or something? I'm trying to think, uh, it was probably this round uh -huh. and probably this long, mm -hmm. in white linen canvas. And the, when it exploded. I suppose there was just like big pieces of shrapnel or something that kind of oh, went everywhere. Oh, you mean when it, when it hit, it was, yes. Uh, I mean, fortunately, I was never on right. on that end of it. But yes, oh yes, it, uh, we, I remember once uh, we hit a uh, paper mill, not a paper mill, I guess a, um, a facility with a, uh, by a river 
that uh, had a, a water wheel, and they did some, and the Japanese were in that, using that, and we hit that, and uh, I heard back from the forward observer, just splinters. Mm -hmm. So that gives you some idea how uh, strong... You could, you could knock out a tank with it? Yeah, although we never, yeah. we never fired on tanks as far as I can remember. Right. Yeah, but I'm sure you could, absolutely. Yeah. And how many men on, a, on, on each uh, howitzer? Probably a crew of 25. For, for what? For the well, whole you had, battery? Well, you had a uh, tractor tank to pull it. Okay. And that took a crew. And that had machine guns on it. And then you had the gun itself and the uh, uh, men who fired the gun. And I, I forget the term. Uh, the, well, in the First World War, they were the caissons. Those were oh, right. the horses. Now we had tanks, and I guess the the artillerymen were the men who uh, uh, fired the gun, mm -hmm. yeah. and it took I don't remember maybe six or eight men yeah. to maintain that gun. Yeah. You had to swab it after each uh, firing. They didn't have any self-propelled uh, guns that would were on. No, that you always, no. You always had to pull them. Yes, somewhere. and did did you have a battery of them? I mean, did you have? Yeah, several? there were four, four to a battery. There were, uh, there were four batteries to a battalion, and then uh, uh, several battalions into some higher command, and, and that was the structure. Yeah. It's been a long time. <laughs> and did you say you acted as forward observer on occasion? Well, uh, yes, after a while, yes. I was very good at reading maps. Uh, I, had a, I have a sense of three dimensions when I look at a flat piece of paper. I can see that. So I became a forward observer. And then scout, and did a lot of that. Did you go up with in the in the Piper Cub? Yeah, I preferred going on the grounds. I didn't feel comfortable. They were very vulnerable. They had no armament at all, and uh, you were uh, subject to machine gun firing, etc. So I preferred being a scout on the ground. Right. Okay. Uh, so when did you? Okay, where'd you go from New Orleans then? From New Orleans via um, Panama Canal to Lee. L-E-A, in New Guinea, which was a landing port. The Australians at that point, now I'm talking, I must, it must, must be 1943, or early 44, and the Australians really had knocked the Japanese out. There were remnants, and we used that as getting used to the, the jungles, and the New Guinea jungles were formidable, formidable. Um, um, you could hardly penetrate them. That's how uh, virile they were. Anyway, uh, we did that, and it really became a staging area, which we didn't know. We knew we were staging for something for the Philippine invasion under MacArthur. And so, uh, uh, ultimately, within a few months, we assembled on LS, LS, landing ships, LSTs, and uh, were part of a huge armada that left from New Guinea into the uh, uh, Bay of uh, Leyte in that uh, thing. And I was uh, D-Day plus one hour, and it was rough. So you're going in uh, kind of like you would see in, did you see the movie Saving Private Ryan? Yeah. How the guys went in, but you were in that kind of a yeah, the only uh, thing the only war movie I ever saw that was accurate was that scene in Private Ryan. Uh, the rest of it and the rest of Private Ryan was a fantasy. You could never hold off that German yeah, armament. Yeah. But that part was how it was. Total chaos. I wonder to this day how uh, how it happened and how I made it. And getting back to religion. Um, I remember landing on the beach finally, soaking wet from the water. Um, uh, the, had, they had miscalculated the coral reef and the tides. So we wound up uh, probably oh, 150, 200 yards short of the shore. And with all the heavy equipment, you couldn't swim. So what we did was we had gasoline uh, drums on the LSTs. Uh, so we, we threw them out, and you would uh, swim behind it and hold on to it. Of course, if it was hit by a mortar fragment, well, you never made the beach. 
Uh, luckily, I made the beach. And <laughs> I remember being soaking wet, not knowing where to go or what to do. There was no organization. And just, and the Navy was bombing the palm trees and the jungle growth just beyond the beachhead. And the beach was probably 100 yards, 150 yards of sand before the palm trees came. And every time a Navy shell or a battleship or a destroyer, I couldn't tell, you couldn't see them, you could hear the noise of the whistle, uh, you would, as the shell hit the ground, you would be thrown up in the air from the concussion. And even though it might have been, in, um, I don't know how far in front of us, couldn't tell. And of course, they sank a lot of, in the uh, Battle of Lady Gulf, some of the aircraft carriers were sunk and the planes were circling overhead. And I remember seeing them uh, crash land on top of the palm trees, the coconut trees, and a lot of guys walked away and came out. It was a miracle because uh, there was no land. You, you couldn't land on the sand because it was filled with us. Yeah. So uh, oh, that they couldn't land there. So they landed the best they could on top of the trees when they ran out of fuel. Were the Japanese right up in the tree line or were they back? Uh, no, further? they were back a little bit. And anyhow, we, that was in the morning. We stayed there all day. And by nightfall and by morning, we secured the beach. I don't know how, but we did. But I remember digging deep into the sand on my belly and praying to my grandfather in heaven to save me. And did you have a, 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 a firearm with you? I had a, um, a carbine and uh, a forty-five mm -hmm. as a sidearm. And were you a sergeant at this time? No, I was a... Uh, Either private first class or a corporal. Yeah. I think a private first class, probably. Uh -huh. And so your job was to get in there and fight and secure the beach until at such time you're, you, they brought your guns in where you yeah. would then go. Yeah, then we, we up until that point, point, you were just like an we infantry, in, infantry. Yeah, we were. Yeah. And was it mainly the Japanese shelling that? Uh, was giving you such a bad time. Well, it was Japanese oh, mortars. Right. And, and were they close enough to be shooting machine guns, that kind of stuff at you? Uh, yeah. If you came up to the tree line, yeah, you would uh, face machine gun fire. But out, out, in, out in the water, in your landing craft, it was mainly the mortars. Oh, yeah. Well, it was only mortars, yeah. Right. It was only mortars dropping in. Yeah. Yeah. And did you lose any of your guys? Yeah, sure. Probably 20% uh, in the landing. Which I guess is what they expect. Yeah. I wouldn't know. Yeah. You know. I, um, there was something about not being a replacement that was very satisfying and secure. There was some level of security of knowing the, the guy next to you uh, who, uh, and not being a stranger that you had gone through certain experiences together. It felt like you could count on him and yeah. he on you and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so what happened the second day then? Well, we started to go inland. I was very amazed at the civilian population, how primitive a life was on Lady. Um, bamboo huts raised above the ground, pigs and chickens living below, so they ate the waste. Uh, um, I don't think they had very much schooling. The Americans uh, didn't do much with that island. But they were very pro-U.S. Uh, they helped us in every way they could. If there was a Japanese person or a contingency hiding somewhere, they would signal and we could flush them out. And so we went forward and it was pretty good. And um, Japanese have snipers? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, you have to be careful. No one wore any rank uh, at all. And you try to be as indistinguishable as you could. It was... The first half of that battle was the dry season, so it never rained. And the second half of that battle was the rainy season, and it, and it only rained uh, every single day, all day. Maybe you'd have every other week, maybe two hours or something when it didn't rain. So I remember my uh, boots were rotted uh, where the sole came off from the mildew and so forth. And of course, a lot of sickness happens then. I had malaria and dysentery. 
uh, and was hospitalized towards the end of that battle. Uh, the hospital was a bombed out Catholic church. And I, is the, I don't know if you're a Catholic, is the yes. term ves, Vespers in the morning? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I would, they would awaken you to the Vespers in the morning. And I loved the music, it was beautiful. And uh, that gave me an inkling about Catholic church pageantry and music. And even to this day, I have an opportunity, I, I visit a Catholic church to, um, to enjoy that part of the ritual that they do. The, um, now, the Japanese, as I understand it, seldom would, would uh, surrender. They just would fight to the... Did you, did you come? Did you... You ask a very good question, yeah. Uh, first of all, on the way over, on the LST, you were shown pictures of, we assumed, American uh, white men hung upside down from trees with their genitals cut off. So we decided, as our unit, that we wouldn't surrender if that was what you were going to face. I don't know now, in retrospect to our government uh, and what's truth or fiction, uh, probably that did happen. But I would say uh, I don't think it really happened, uh, uh, but rarely. But that wasn't the point of it. The point was to uh, coalesce all of the ambiguity that you might have about surrendering to fortify that. The Japanese didn't surrender. They were excellent soldiers. They could live on a kerchief full of rice and a little sake for months in a hole in the ground. Americans uh, needed their rations and other things, but it, they couldn't get prisoners. So they offered a case of beer and a three-day pass to where, I don't know, but and you could have three days off if you brought in a prisoner. Uh, after two days, they stopped all that offer because they had more prisoners than they knew what to do with. So obviously, they, uh, we weren't taking prisoners. Mm-hmm. And so that, that, that evolved that. Um, I uh, was very studious about being appropriate when I could capture someone. I wouldn't shoot them. Um, but uh, at that point, uh, people in my outfit uh, didn't follow that rule. And that disturbed me a lot. I wondered how civilized people could do that. If a person surrenders, so accept that. You know. And they were kids like we were. You know, when you look close, they were 18, 19 year old Japanese boys. It didn't make sense. But do wars make sense? And also, old men send young boys to war. So uh, there's a difference in, in that. But you don't want to get me into that philosophical discussion. Okay, so um, uh, when did that uh, uh, campaign end? That campaign ended uh, probably uh, within four months or so. And I remember I was in the hospital and I walked out to join my outfit who was now boarding another LSD for Luzon. I didn't want to lose contact because uh, I think by that time I might have been a sergeant. Um, And uh, casualties were high unless you were young, very high, either from sickness or just carelessness or so forth. And I was a good soldier. I became really good. I was combat efficient. And uh, as a sergeant, you had, uh, you were responsible for... Yeah, for one gun and the tank and the men beneath me. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, I think, one or two corporals. Did you mind having that responsibility? No, I liked it. Yeah, I wanted to be a war hero. I have to confess that. Yeah, I thought I could do brave things. Yeah. But, you know, I was at this well, point brave, maybe 19. I mean, I mean, a guy just charging, you might say, is foolhardy and brave, but, uh, but, but a, 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 someone in, in, in a command, I mean, takes a lot more than just oh, being brave. Oh, okay, so at, at that point, uh, that's true, right. Uh, the responsibility was, was, was heavy. Uh, you were responsible for, for people's lives, of, you know, what you did or, or didn't do. Um, and so we landed in Luzon, but we had no opposition. And I didn't, at that time, I think we came in D-Day about 24 hours uh, later. And we came in the central part of the island. The island is elongated, if you recall the map. And we came in the middle part, and the army divided in half. Half went south for Manila, and half went north 
for the retreating Japanese army, and uh, my outfit was assigned to go north. And we went across the island practically to the, well, uh, two-thirds across, and then started north into the mountains. And they were like the uh, 9, 10, 11,000 foot mountains here, except heavily forested that you have here. Difficult terrain. And so we couldn't take the guns with us. We left them at the bottom. And because uh, the trails were trails, one person with. Or if you were lucky, you could run a jeep up part of it. But talking about how the Japanese could live on a bag of rice and a, a bottle of sake, uh, as we started to chase them up the mountains, they would fire mortars to hit the trail to cause a landslide to stop the pro progress. So we would send up two bulldozers, brand new bulldozers. The first bulldozer would go into the hole, fill up the hole, the guy would get out, the soldier would get out, and the second bulldozer would push earth over it, and then we'd advance. And that's a true, I saw that with my own eyes many, many times. And that's how we won the war, with the sheer might of our production and our wear. And this is true. And of course, uh, the steel bulldozer held, held the earth and filled the hole, and we, we could progress. And later on in the story, I'll tell you the first question the Japanese asked me was, uh, about our abilities to do that. They were stunned by the American manufacturing mentality and ability to deliver. Of course, the war is all about supplies. Well, Yamamoto knew all about that, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. He said that that's that what was, was yes. going to happen. Um, so did you have any heavy, uh, did you have like a machine gun uh, with you? or? Yes, uh, we had bazookas? machine guns and yeah, rifles. But it was uh, no major big battles. The terrain was too difficult. It was sort of narrow. And fighting um, invisible armies, because they were wonderful at hiding. Usually it took a casualty to see where they were. And what about, uh, could our air, air cover help out at all? We didn't have any and air cover. They, they must have been used somewhere else. Um, Later on, we had air cover for supplies. They were C-47s who would drop parachutes, of which uh, half of it would be unavailable. It would fall down into a ravine. You could never retrieve it. But, you know, again, if they needed one, they sent ten. So you got your one. Yeah, that was how that was. And uh, so this is on Luzon. And uh, how did that wrap up then? That, uh... Well... Yeah, I remember advancing north slowly, inch by inch, yard by yard, and then on a shortwave radio I heard that the Americans had dumped, dropped a atomic bomb in Japan. And I had taken a little bit of organic and inorganic chemistry, and I had a vague idea. I had studied something about atomic structure and atoms and, and so forth, although I really knew. But I knew there was tremendous energy involved. I remember the guys asking because um, not too many of them had even finished high school. And I explained that it probably was what it was. And by the second bomb, and I kept thinking, this was August, and wouldn't it be great if the war would be over on my birthday, August 10th? But it wasn't until probably the 20th of the, when Japan surrendered. And uh, so we were in the forward positions up in this mountain where the major Japanese army was, probably um, almost 200,000 soldiers, perhaps, 150 to 200,000, I don't recall. Um, and so that was that, and I said to myself, God, you made it. You made the war, you didn't get killed, and you didn't get wounded. And what a miracle. And I remember feeling good, and then, like, all my civilian blood kept flowing into my veins. You know, time to go home. So we were sent back to a rest camp, and I was there about a week when I was called in to the captain's office. Oh, and the captain was a replacement. It was a teacher from Baltimore with the strange name of Marvel, M-A-R-V-E-L. And I don't think I knew the comics at that time, captain but Marvel. he was Captain Marvel. <laughs> and uh, he was the, uh, the complete opposite of what Captain Marvel should be. He was a really uh, probably 35, 
uh, scared to death, uh, really relied on me. I became his alter ego because here I had uh, almost three years of combat experience and the intellect to converse with him. Uh, and so he trusted me. And so I became his right hand man and uh, I was made uh, a staff sergeant then. Well, they say sergeants run the army. Oh. It, I mean. oh, well, perhaps. <laughs> anyway, I was assigned, the outfit was assigned to go back and accept the surrender of the Japanese army. And so he called me to tell me that I was going to go first and I was to meet the Japanese general staff and uh, set up communications. Where would this be? In northern Luzon, in the mountains that we had just left. And so, of course, I was familiar with the area. So I went, I was driven up to the base of the mountains, and then it was a uh, full day's walk back up until the next morning. Uh, and uh, someone, uh, the topography was a Y, two trails and a single trail. And the, whoever arranged this was that the dividing line between the Americans and the Japanese would be at the base of the Y. And that from that point down, they would become prisoners. From that point up, it was Japanese territory. And I was to meet the Japanese general staff somewhere up here and give them a telephone, give, give them a telephone and a reel of telephone line. And the telephone, I mean a hand cranking, a signal core telephone. And they were to run the line all the way down to the bottom of the Y. And we, when my outfit came, would run the line up and we'd uh, fuse it and we'd have communications because we had to determine how many Japanese soldiers were to come down every day to be uh, uh, taken as prisoners of war via the Geneva Conference rules on prisoners of war. And we were told to obey them, but we were never told what they were. So there I was. And I went, in, and, and a Japanese man soldier was to meet me at the base of that Y. And when I got there, there was no one there. But, you know, I was already uh, veteran-wise, never is what they say it is. And so I began to walk up the right-hand arm of the Y, which was where I was supposed to go. And when I got, I don't know, maybe half hour up that road, I began to hear a lot of noise. Obviously, I was spotted, and I had a 45 in my carbine. Were you alone? I was alone. I had a backpack with the telephone and the spool of wire in it, and some rations, and that's what I had. And I'm, I think I'm, I'm 20 years old. I'm gonna, no, maybe 20, 21, maybe. Anyway, here on this kid from New York City walking up this Jungle Trail. Now, your cap, that was your Captain Marvel. Yes. And, and, and your your, your squad. Your, were you like the most forward position? Is that why they picked you guys? I to do guess this? so. Yeah. We knew the area. We had been fighting for it. So, at this point, I see. Finally, I see a camp, and then this person who was supposed to meet me comes running out, a Japanese soldier, no armament at all, and there's a language barrier. So I stop. Did you have any insignia on? Do you know what his rank was? No. And even if I had, oh, I wouldn't have. I, I was more concerned with the thousands of Japanese soldiers around. And I, I drew my history from the movies, from the black and white movies. And when I saw the Japanese camp, the first thing I did was throw my sh shoulders back, stand erect, and walk in as an American. And so uh, as I walked into the camp, I saw a very large uh, white canvas tent, quite long. And I was taken, and I hear all this chatter, everyone's looking at me, and I, but I'm walking in with shoulders back. And I get into the tent, and there is a very long table with a lot of old men sitting behind it. They looked as old as my father. And that was the Japanese general staff. Uh, Let's take a pause. i got to change tapes. So you're come to this table. Yeah. And there are a, a lot of men, Japanese officers sitting there. And in the center was obviously the general, whose name I didn't know. It turns out he was a Yamashita. 
and uh, the Tiger of Malaya, was that what they called it? I think so, who subsequently I read on the internet, uh, he was hung. Uh, but at the time, um, he just was another Japanese uh, person to me. I didn't know the name or anything else. And his long, long table with a very thin uh, rider of fabric on it, nothing else. And I walk up to this table, and the first thing I do is I realize, what am I doing with my guns? So I take off my carbine, put it on the table, unstrap my 45, and lay it on the table as a gesture of peace and goodwill. And uh, I, I was, again, thinking of some Gary Cooper uh, movie where he might do something like that. So I did that. And then I realized uh, there's a language barrier. I, how am I going to talk to them and tell them about the telephone? Because that was really the objective, to set up communication. So out of uh, frustration, I look around and I say, does anyone speak English? And from the, down at the, uh, my left, someone says, yes, I do, in perfect English. And the general says something in Japanese, and this man, an officer, comes and stands behind the general, uh, behind him. and. I said, and where did you learn how to speak English like that? And he says, I went to the University of Chicago. And so now we could communicate. And uh, I introduced myself to the general, and he introduced himself to me, but I, it didn't mean any, anything to me, through the interpreter, this is. And uh, I tell him what my mission is. And they, you know, I took off my backpack, show them, what they knew all of what to do, etc. And so basically my mission was over. At which point they asked uh, uh, some orderly to bring a chair. And now they bring me a chair and so I'm sitting opposite the general and they begin to question me about, tell them about America. And they wanted to know how we could build the road so fast and how we could get the supplies up. And that seemed to be a tremendous interest to in them. And of course, I bragged as much as I could about how wonderful we are, which we are, in spite of our failings. We are wonderful. Um, and then they began to ask me questions about the United States. And I was very disappointed in the level of questions they were asking me. One of them was, they wanted to know about Al Capone. And I was amazed that these men who would be tantamount to Eisenhower and MacArthur and so forth, would have such a uh, provincial attitude about the world to ask about Al Capone in, in 1945 now. But they did, and I, I'm sure I answered it the best I could, or bragged as much as I could. Um, and then it was time for dinner. And so uh, orderlies came in and laid out a nice tablecloth, and they had bowls in China, and cups, and they served them, and they put a thing in front of me. By the way, I had never eaten Japanese food at that time. Uh, the most we had was Chinese food. Uh, but I saw, and of course, you have to realize uh, this was the tail end of the war. They were very limited in supplies, and it looked to me there was uh, greens of some kind, soup, and a pale white yellow liquid, which was probably sake, I'm not sure. And uh, I took out my seat. By that time, we had come to the point where we no longer were being fed by Australia, which was awful food. But the Americans now had sea rations, and you had macaroni and uh, meatballs or whatever, I forget. But it was... Okay, and you pulled open the can and you ate it cold, but in, in the tropics nothing was cold. Um, and so the Japanese general was very interested in what I was eating. So I decided that here I am, the only American, I'm going to be as, as forthright and nice as I can be. And I offered him, why don't we exchange meals? He can have mine and I'll have his. And so that's what we did. And uh, I'm condensing this, but it seemed to me that was basically the major way the time went. And then they were tired. They were going to sleep. And I said I would stay here in this tent. And I lied down on the ground. 
and couldn't hardly sleep. First of all, I was very excited by what had happened and interested in all there was because I was a curious kid. And uh, also, too, I was apprehensive uh, what could happen. But I'm sure I dozed on and off for the And the morning came and they served me some hot tea. And when I left, the general came over and shook my hand and made some comment, you're like a very nice boy, and gave me a present, a, a, a fabric, all folded up, which I put into my fatigue pocket and saluted and left and went back. And my outfit was supposed to be at the bottom of that Y. When I got there, they weren't there yet. Again, another a bit of omni planning. Did, did uh, they assume that you would spend the night who you, did? Your guys. I mean, was that part of the plan that you Oh, I don't know. They sort of, Captain Marvel was glad. I, you know, for all I know, maybe Captain Marvel was assigned to go and turned it over to me in any event. Cause I, I mean, when you went up, did you go up with the intention of spending the night? What time did you meet them during the day? I met them probably uh, close to noontime. I didn't even think that through. Uh, you know, in the Army, uh, in combat, you, you live in the moment mm -hmm. and you do what you have to do. I didn't think about that. Um, also, too, it was uh, pleasant to sleep under a tent. Uh, so when I get back down, um, the, my outfit isn't there. And my outfit cons consists of 97 men, me, 98, and two FBI agents who were once policemen from Chicago who were looking for Philippine war criminals. In other words, Philippine citizens who had collaborated with the Japanese and were wanted for war atrocities. And they could take any rank they wanted up to colonel. They couldn't go above colonel. But they were, I got to know them quite well. Uh, they were really cool. They, each one leaned against the tree on each side of the road, the path. When I say road, I mean trail. Uh, but I'll get to that in a moment. Now I'm here alone. And uh, so I remember the gift. I take out the gift. And it's a beautiful big silk fabric, all hand painted with pornography on it. And I was disgusted as a naive child um, at those days that that was really culturally a very extravagant gift to be given, that in the Japanese culture, among warriors especially, uh, to receive that was a outstanding gift. But again, I said, I. I I kept thinking of men like that in my father's age, giving me this. Um, my Puritan roots were coming up. I would not do that today. Um, I threw it away. And that was the end of it. It wasn't until later in civilian life, which I happened to be in the art business and uh, studied art, recognized the intrinsic value and the uh, psychological value of what that gift meant. In any event, the next day my outfit came. And so we set up things as per the Geneva con Convention. So we telephone up to send 300 men down in the morning, soldiers. And they would come marching in, shoulders back. Uh, early in the morning, uh, they would get to our camp at sunrise and bow down on the ground, pray to the rising sun. And then we would uh, uh, take their bolts from their rifles and then search them. And any sharp object they had, we would take away. We would take away all their money that they had stolen. We would steal now. In other words, we had uh, uh, Dutch guilders and British pounds and French marks and English pounds and American banknote dollars from Philippine banks and Chinese yen and uh, from Singapore. We had all this money and we, this is a narrow road a narrow path with probably 25 yards on each side and a clearing where we lived. This is the spot that had some width to it. And the sea, empty sea carton rations that were dropped down by parachute, that's where we kept throwing the money and it was filling all over the place. And it was used to light a cigarette, it was used for toilet paper, uh, you know, it had no value. It was just paper and ink, that's all it was in that circumstance. And we, so I, I, I sort of 
left at the irony of here they robbed all of the countries they had uh, stolen, and we in turn were looting them. But you know, to the victor goes the spoils, and that was it. And then we sent them down the mountain trail, or one man wide, and trucks would wait down below uh, to take them to prisoner war camps. And we communicated with shortwave radio between the bottom of the mountains and that. It would be like at El Paseo and uh, 74 was the bottom of the mountain. Um, <coughs> and they were very disciplined. And if someone was sick and didn't watch right, they, the Japanese pushed them off the mountain. And uh, you know they didn't want to be disgraced in, in any way. And as the days and the weeks went by, uh, the um, the um, soldiers and what now became mixed with civilians. Because as the Japanese retreated from Manila, they took Japanese nationals and Philippine collaborators with them for whatever skills they might have had. And so now we were getting civilians mixed with soldiers, and that's when the FBI became very alert. And they were no pictures. Ready. I said, how do you know who you're looking for? They said, we know. And they did. They were looking for one couple specifically, a man and a woman, very beautiful woman. I remember her. Uh, and you could hardly tell she was different than the other. But they knew, and they pulled her out and pulled him out and took him uh, off to the side and questioned them and then went down with them. So their job was done, obviously, that they were looking for, for that couple. So one morning, as, the, as they come down, I see that the Japanese are beating one of their own on the floor, on the ground, on the earth. I'm, I'm a civilian now, I say floor, mm -hmm. on, the, on the earth. And uh, so I, as a humanitarian, as a as a civilian, really, I, I can't stand by and see that. So I go over with my 45 and menacingly, you know, tell them to disperse and go down further down and be processed. And I'm, I hear someone say, thank you very much, sir. And I'm amazed that I hear it. I said, what? He says, thank you very much, sir. And there's this person all um, in like a fetal position uh, from protecting himself from the blows. And I said, who are you? He said, I'm a doctor. I said, and you speak English? He said, yes. I said, just stay here. Wait a minute. And my mind worked quickly. I said, first of all, here we are. We don't have any communication at all. There's no one that we have that speaks Japanese. Now we have a Japanese person that speaks English. We could use him. And number two, if he's a doctor, someone really gets sick here or so forth, uh, uh, it'll be a boon to have this. But I can't do this on my own. So I go back, I rush down to Captain Marvel, who's sitting quietly in his tent, uh, all huddled together reading a book. And I tell Captain Marvel uh, what I say. He says, whatever you want to do is okay with me. So I go back and I say to this, this man, uh, he, and now he's, he's old. He's got to be maybe 50 years old. But that was old to, to us. And he was a Japanese civilian who lived in Manila, had a practice, and when the Japanese retreated, they took it because they needed a doctor. So I said to him, you, you don't have to go down with the prisoners. You stay with me, but I'll tell you this. There are 99 Americans here, and if they have an opportunity, they're going to kill you. Don't let me out of your sight. Stay next to me like you're glue. I want you with us. I need you as a translator, and I need you to be a doctor in case something happens. Well, when the outfit heard that I had accepted a Japanese into our midst, they were furious with me. And you talked about any prejudice about being a Jew. I was called Jap lover, Jew, bastard, uh, different things. And uh, I could live with that uh, because I felt what I was doing was important. To conclude this aspect of the story, one night, about a week later, a crazed Japanese throws a hand grenade into our outfit, and six men are seriously wounded. And all we have is a medic with a medic, uh, limited thing. Well, of course, um, the doctor came with me, and uh, during the night, uh, with the supplies, was able to stop the bleeding 
and uh, administer morphine. And in the morning, we cut down uh, trees and made with poncho stretchers. And 12 men now we lost. And six is 18, took the six wounded. And of course, at that point, uh, they uh, stopped being uh, anti-Semitic and anti-Japanese, et cetera, realized that that was a good move. Um, when the last of the Japanese prisoners came through, he had to go. I said to him, now you must go. I can't hold on to you any longer. And we had become friendly, obviously. We ate and slept together. And he was a nice man, really a nice man. And uh, I wrote a letter uh, to whom it may concern uh, that what he had done and to please treat him with kindness and every uh, effort should be made to recognize that he is a civilian uh, uh, drafted, conscripted by the Japanese army. Um, I was back in college about four years later, three years later, I got a letter from Osaka, I believe, from him thanking me for having saved his life. So that was a, a nice humanitarian aspect to a cruel war. And um, that was that to wind up that aspect of it. Um, now it's time to go back down and get home. It's uh, probably December now, or maybe November, from August. Uh, all, all this money. So I have this uh, uh, backpack still, no, no telephone and no wire. And so we all did that. We stuffed all our pockets with money. I only took Amer uh, American banknotes uh, from Philippine banks. And they were not large denominations. They were uh, 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 five tens and twenties and some twos and some ones. Well, I tried not to take ones, but, you know, I stuffed it all in and thinking, God, I'm rich here. This poor thing. You know, I had no idea how much money it was, but just like paper stuffed in. And so I walked down the mountain, and this truck's waiting to take us back to a rest camp to wait to go to get a ship to go back home. And uh, I got a three-day pass to Manila. And I went to Manila, and I took all this money with me, and it was not worth anything. The Americans had uh, disavowed the fall of the banks and the banknotes, obviously, so there was no value to them. But I had a feeling there was value to them. And so I moseyed around Manila and found a, a Chinese person somewhere, don't ask me how, who said to me, yes, if you go down that alleyway, there are some money lenders and traders down there. And I went down there and uh, uh, he, he told me uh, that uh, there was no value to that. I don't remember if they gave me five cents on the dollar, I think. One day in 1949, I'm reading the New York Times on the very last page, and it says the United States Congress has honored that money, 100 cents on the dollar. By the way, the money I got, I lost in a crap game on the boat coming home. <laughs> but I started with nothing, and I came back with a lot. It wasn't money, but I had learned a lot about life. I learned about who I was and what kind of a person I could be, and I was anxious to get back to school. Where, where did you come back into the States? Uh, San Diego. Um, I'd never been out of New York, really. Uh, I was on a, uh, I guess, a naval base there. I'm not too sure. When I telephoned a friend of Iris's, who the person that I had met Iris through, her name was Eileen, and she lived in Los Angeles, and I just telephoned her to say that there I was, and you couldn't leave the base. And um, a few hours later, I'm called to the general's office and given a, a three-day pass. It seems that her father was in the infantry in the First World War with this general, whoever was at this base, I have no idea who it was, telephoned him, and I got a pass, and, I, and they drove down to San Diego. I had no idea what they did, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, you know what I'm thinking? Maybe it was Camp Pendleton. I'm not sure because I don't remember the drive being that long, like it would be two hours. 
but I'm not sure, you know, I'm first thinking about this now, sitting here talking to you. Anyway, I remember, and I, there I was in, with civilians in a civilian house, and I remember um, he gave me a whiskey to drink to, as a congratulatory, and I couldn't hold it. It was hard coming back. Yeah. And, and I stammered. I began to stammer very badly. So I guess all of this, uh, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, I guess, you know. Was it because of all that you had seen? Yeah, I think so. Think? Yeah, it had no outlet. I couldn't afford to let it come out. Um, and, and, and really, it's healthy that I cry. Uh, uh, it, it, it manifested itself once the tension was over. Yeah. So uh, and you that was that. And Dear John letter, that was probably the coup de grace. Well, <laughs> anyway. Interestingly enough, we're all friends still to this day. The family that picked him up and that oh. I need. Yeah, we meet once a month oh, yeah. in uh, Riverside oh. at the Mission Inn. Oh, yeah. lunch. We just, we stayed there uh, last month, first time. Oh, isn't it lovely? It is just, I was so taken with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we go stuff. every month and meet there for lunch. It's a lovely place. I've never stayed over. Uh, we ought to do that once, yeah, really. just for oh, the experience. You oh, you should. Yeah, yeah, I know we have to. Yeah, yeah. just for the experience, yeah. Anyway, so that's... Uh, so how did you get back to New York then? Uh, C-47 with stops every half hour, it seemed, because they had fuel li limitations. I remember L.A., I'm sorry, uh, whatever it was, San Diego or, 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 or Camp Pendleton into Texas somewhere, and then I think probably Louisiana and maybe uh, Georgia and Washington into New Jersey, Fort Dix, where it started. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the bus back to New York and the subway home. And so there it was, full circle. And how, how long... Had it been since about you... three years? Yeah, eighteen to twenty-one, roughly. Yeah. And then yeah. you went back to school. Pardon me. Then, then you went back to school. Oh yeah, then I went back. Yeah. yeah, then I went back to college. And, and I, I was you... a sophomore then. Okay, were you still in pre-med? Yeah, I was in pre-med. And if you want to hear an interesting story, there's a doctor out here called Dr. Larry Cohn, I know Lawrence Cohn, mm -hmm. and uh, so. Um, when I came out to Palm Springs, Rancho Mirage, Iris had used him for a doctor, and so she introduced me to him, and he became my physician of note. And so he invited me to his house one night for dinner. Iris and I went. And we're sitting around at the dinner table, and he said to me, where did you go to school? I said, NYU. He said, where? I said, up at the Heights. There were two campuses, one in Greenwich Village and one up in the Bronx, and in the Bronx was pre-med and engineering. Those were the two schools up there. And he said, so did I. He said, when did you graduate? I said, I don't remember, 48 or 49. So he gets away from the table, and he brings out the yearbook, and there I'm in it with him. And I remembered him then. He was, I hated him. He was so smart. He never had to study. He had a photographic memory, we, and I shared this with him. And I, he didn't remember me, because you know, I really didn't hang around with him. He was three years younger. So the veterans sort of stuck together, and the regular kids stuck together. You know, I thought that was an interesting aside. So uh, uh, we've, uh, we've re remained uh, friends socially, too, in addition. Could you use your GI Bill? Yes, it NYU? was. It was a tremendous relief not to have to worry. Tuition at NYU was $250 for 18 credits a semester, uh, which was a lot of money. After the war, I uh, had all my books, full tuition, 18 credits, and I forget, it was either 50 or $60 a month, money. Uh, and so, you know, that was wonderful. Um, and so I finished pre-med, couldn't get into med school, and went to Columbia for a master's in psychology, thinking that if I had another um, accent to my credentials, uh, then I would uh, have a better chance. But then I became restless about not getting on with life. I was really old. I was 25, 24, 25. And so uh, 
I went into the business world. And were you still uh, using your musical talents? No, just personally. Yeah, I, three years of not playing, you lose a lot of your technique. I guess you could get it back, but I, I, I was not interested in doing that. I was interested in uh, building a career and, so and, and, and going into uh, becoming a man in a great final suit. That, that was what was the, culturally the thing to, to do, and so you know, being you, a, pr a product of my culture, sure. What did you go into? I that? went into the textile business and um, had a degree of success. I did that for 18 years. Um, wound up uh, a director of research and development. Uh, my medical pre-med science training was helpful. And um, I was a creative person. I could envision things. Did you have your own business? No, no, I you... worked for a large corporation. What was that? Um, originally, it was called Shear Brothers, and then ultimately it became Crown Textile. Uh, it was uh, common in the late 50s and 60s for uh, large corporations to keep swallowing up the smaller ones until you were a public company. And... Did you make textiles to sell yeah, people? To, yeah, to, it, it you was uh, yes, the company. The finished product. Yeah, it was a vertical setup where the raw product was woven into a textile and finished and dyed and then uh, sold to uh, dress and coat and suit manufacturers. Right? Yeah, that was the, that. That was that. And so I stayed in that for 17 years. And when that business was sold, um, I had meanwhile become very interested in art. And no relationship to the Japanese silk uh, piece. And uh, began personally collecting art and studying art and taking art lessons and attending lectures and went into the art business, formed a company called Art for Industry and did that uh, uh, until I retired. So uh, that was a very splendid life to live. And when did you start your family? Uh, I got married. In, in 1950, or 51, I guess, and in 57 had a daughter, and seven and six, and, four, and, and 62 had a son. Uh, have, have, these are, have. In fact, my daughter is coming out Wednesday. And what are their names? Her name is Jamie, and my son's name is John. And what do they do? Uh, do they Jamie do? has a store in Woodstock called Timbuktu that sells um, artifacts and uh, home furnishings and art objects, etc. And as a matter of fact, if this went on national television, my son would be very happy. He's opening up a restaurant in New York called Roberto's. I think that's it. It's an Argentinian steakhouse. And it was supposed to be ready for Thanksgiving. Uh, last word is it's uh, April 1st. So I'm looking forward to going back to the opening. But we'll see what happens. So that's what he does. John does that. John has two daughters. Um, um, six and two, I think, or five and two, and my daughter has a son of 14, a grandson, so uh, that's, and then I've adopted three of Iris's grandchildren who live in San Luis Obispo. There's Samantha and Daniel and Haley, and as a matter of fact, uh, Daniel is going to be really interested in this tape. Um, really want to give it to him. He's fascinated by the Second World War and whatever medals I got and emblems, etc., I've given to him because of all the grandchildren, he's the only one that's really exhibited any real honest interest in this. And so I think it's befitting that he have that. Absolutely. What were some of the uh, decorations that you well, got? Well, I, I got, of course, the Good Conduct Medal. And I don't remember. You got medals for different campaigns you did and then stars and so forth. So no silver crosses and no purple hearts, fortunately. <laughs> yeah. But whatever they were, they're he's excited by them. Oh. And so uh, I'm pleased to give them. I have already given them to him. And your children, uh, their mother, what was her name? Your oh, first uh, Renee. Mm -hmm. Renee. Uh, she was, uh, we were divorced after 35 years of marriage. She was a wonderful woman. Uh, we have a limited relationship now when I go to New York. And we're together with the children. I see and her. where did you meet her? And what was her maiden name? Her maiden name was Isaac. And her father was a dentist. And she was, uh, I met her on, uh, a friend of mine was dating her, and I was attracted to her when I saw her. I was out with someone else, not a, I was, I had received the Dear John letter, and so 
And we'll, I was, we won't forget that, will we? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, and so I asked this friend of mine, would he mind if I dated her? And he said no. So I called her up and uh, told her that he had given me, whoever, his name was Julius, I think, had given me permission to date her. And so uh, that's how we became friends. Okay. And when did you first come to the desert? Um, eight years ago, when I was 70 years old. And what brought you out here? Well, Iris had invited me out two years prior for a week. And it seemed nice. And she suggested that why don't I retire and come out here. Okay, t Iris, why don't, you, uh, why don't you hop over there again. Let's, uh, let's get a duel going here. By the way, did you make any notes that he... Uh, he should. Uh, but he got. I, he already I did, got. But he got two of them. So oh, okay. Of them well, good. The last, Sorry, that's okay. The last one was the <laughs> FBI. So. Uh, okay. So when did you guys kind of, more or less, get back together, well, real we, friendly we, and uh, stuff? Again? When, well, when Iris would come to New York, even when I was married, uh, she would stop by. My wife and I and Iris would have dinner together, or it was a concert in Central Park. Uh, we would go. We, you know, did, did that. So it was always contact and. Um, when Iris heard I got divorced, uh, she was already separated from her husband. Um, I guess out of guilt uh, for the uh, um, Dear John letter. Uh, I'm being, You're not careful to get another one. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she came to New York and we met and uh, we had lunch and I remember we went for a walk in Central Park. I was living in Connecticut at that time in Litchfield and uh, she tells me this, that I kissed her on the forehead in a very loving way, which turned her into the potential that perhaps there was still some uh, potential for us. And so I think at that point, by the time I left her that afternoon, I kissed her on the lips. And, oh, we and, don't have to get into all of that now. And, that was 18 years ago. Let's let that one be and, on. In the what is the Library of Congress? They're going to be fascinated. <laughs> they're going to they're going to eliminate. I think I better stop them now. <laughs> and I caught my train back to Connecticut, and that's how it started. But Iris lived out here, and I lived in Connecticut, and so um, if I I think I came out once or twice for a week. Yeah, or but so. I, I had an apartment in New York. Oh, you had an apartment in New York too, right? I forgot <laughs> that. And so she came in with summer, and then I think during the summer, you came in and stayed because yeah, was. And so we, we began to see each other, and she thought I would enjoy living out there. And after the second year, I came out for a week and decided I would try it. And so I asked Iris to rent me an apartment uh, in Bermuda Dunes. I, before I left, I found something there that seemed nice. The rent was reasonable. I, don't, I think you rented furniture for me. Anyhow, and so, so forth. And so I came out with a six-month lease thinking that would be a fair way to try it. Also, too, at that point in my life, I had really taken inventory when I turned 70 and realized I had done an awful lot of things. I lived a, and I'm living a very rich life, but I was missing something. And I discovered I was missing spirituality. I didn't know where to get that. And then it came to me from the Old Testament, I'll paraphrase it, that they wandered in the desert for 40 years before they found the promised land. And so this seemed to me to be sort of logical. Here I knew someone in a new place that was a desert, that, and I knew that deserts from going to Sedona, etc., had spiritual qualities, etc. And so that was the decision. And of course, I've been here since. And uh, I have found my spirituality. And it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I plan to live another 21 years in good health and in good spirits. And this is a wonderful place to do it in. Absolutely. Now, you're living at Rancho Las Palmas? Yes. How long have you had your place there? Oh, probably four years out of the eight. I, or something like that, yeah. Do you play golf? No, tennis, I don't play tennis, golf. Uh, what I do is hike. I hike in the mountains oh. and have uh, many wonderful experiences, solitary, unique, different. Oh, so you go to school. Oh, that. yes, and I go to college That's of the That's what desert. I'm good for. Yes, I go to College of the Desert. I must have 50 or 60 credits accumulated by this point. I've always said that it's, it's, it's got to be fun to go to college when you don't have to have the credits. You're just there yeah. to learn or He's take what you want to do. He's very conscientious about it, though. He's still... Um, well, I have a 4.0 average. 
<laughs> but why not? And he, yeah, he no, does not circuit. He doesn't take a day off. Of it's yeah. interesting to look at that from the perspective of 79 years old. Uh, I think that's really a uh, interesting thing. Uh, it's a wonderful school. You know, uh, uh, community colleges are looked down on, and that's a misnomer. Uh, first of all, they get very good faculty because it's a four-day week in very good climate with summers off. Um, they have really a high level of faculty. The students are varied. Um, if I can say anything at all, I would say the high schools do very poor in preparing them for college in terms of basics like writing, grammar, punctuation. But all that said, you can learn an awful lot. Uh, I've learned an awful lot. I've taken a geology course, which has been excellent. And of course, what better environment to look at and appreciate and study geology than the desert? I've taken an astronomy course, which of course, again, once you go out in the desert at night, you can see the heavenly bodies. And... Um, a variety of things. I took a course in death and dying, which was terrible. I was a very bad professor. Uh, I could teach that course in a much more positive way. How about writing? Uh, and then I've taken uh, writing. I took a creative writing course and wound up winning first prize in short stories. Uh, and have, I'm now writing a novel, uh, which gave me the courage because I never thought I could be an author. But, you know, anyone can be an author. And What's the setting for your novel? Pardon me? What's the setting for your novel? Uh, the desert, basically. Contemporary or...? It's called, uh, at this point, the title is Themen and the Jade Green Stone. Uh, Themen representing the man, T-H-E-M-A-N. Yeah. And the Jade Green Stone is uh, the holy grail of finding in life what you're looking for. And if you, once you find it, uh, it isn't over, it first begins. That's my experience of life. Is it somewhat autobiographical? I would say it has to be. Anybody who writes appropriately has to come from their own life experiences. Yeah. That's great. Iris, uh, tell us uh, what your kids are doing now. And what my kids are doing? Uh -huh, and their names and all that stuff. Oh, and how much film have you got? Lots. Because I have five kids, Mel. Four are married. I have eleven grandchildren. So, let's see. I knew Vicky very well. Yes, to Vicky play tennis with her. What what is she doing? Vicky uh, actually does a lot of um, good work. She is is employed, but has also volunteered for an organization called Casa, Court Ordered Surrogate Appointees, I believe, is the thing. And she's still a tennis player, and she has uh, two children, one still in college, and her son is in the Peace Corps in Africa. She's now finished one year and seems very happy. And, uh, Where in Africa is he? What country? Senegal. In the remote... Don't, don't you... <laughs> no, no, well, in, in the remote village, and his function is an unusual young man. He does I, agroforestry. Uh, he is to teach them how to uh, not cut down the rainforest, mm -hmm. but to plant uh, mm -hmm. a, and plant uh, orange trees so they'll have a source of food plus a cash crop, and then related in lower, I think, some kind of grain, etc. And learned the language in a very short period of time. He has a master's in psychology. Uh, he's an unusual young man, very, very brave, and... Uh, I think he'll make a great contribution to whatever part of life he settles into. Most everybody is well employed and happy. Uh, the one son is a builder, one son is a lawyer. Two daughters are actually, two daughters are teachers. Uh, the eleven grandchildren, so far, they range in age, of course, from different parents, from. 26 down to, how old is Henry? Henry is About six. six. <laughs> Any great-grandchildren yet? No, nobody, nobody there is married. But all, most, let me see, I'm saying, I hope college education has been going along very well, top to bottom. And down to, um, nobody steals hubcaps, nobody's been in jail. <laughs> what more can I ask? That's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> and you live... Do you live at Tamaris? Where do you live? 
I live in Rancho Mirage near Tamarisk, and um, my credentials are in in the time in the desert, having been a besides a homemaker and a mother and grandmother. Um, I did seven years as a commissioner for Rancho Mirage. Don't ask me what years ago. Before that, I had done another seven years as an assistant to one of the commissioners for the State Preservation, Historical Preservation yeah. Commission. And um, that sort of covers it. And I was since I've been unemployed. What, what are you doing for fun these days? For what? For fun. Well, um, golf would be the main part and uh, fun. We go to theater a lot, go to movies a lot, we have friends and have dinner. It's, it's a pretty normal Coachella Valley life, at least yeah. Rancho Mirage life. And, um, do, you, do you guys go back to New York in the, in the summertime much? Well, we don't. We go back to visit, yeah. yeah. And I've been going to Coronado for the summer. Oh, well, since, that's nice. Since 9-11. Yeah. Well, before that, we traveled quite a bit. Yeah, we used to yeah. travel to Europe and so yeah. forth. Oh. But since 9-11, we we got Stay to close to home. Um, maybe perhaps this year a little more. I, I was stationed at North Island in, oh, were you? for two oh, years, so I'm really? very familiar with Coronado. We have a daughter that lives in Solana Beach, so we spend a lot of time down I there. I love the beach, man. I love to walk it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That strand, I used to So to you were in the Navy? I was a dental officer in the Navy, yeah. yeah I see. Do you want to sit here? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a good time to wrap things up. Either of you want to, or both, uh, any... Uh, Final thoughts? Yeah, I just want to add one other person that's important in my life in addition to my children is my nephew, Stephen. And uh, we speak at least once a week, and uh, I think I'm a surrogate father to him. Not I think, I am a surrogate father to him. And uh, he's probably my closest male friend, which is quite unusual. There's 20 years difference in age. That's my sister Rita's firstborn kid. So. Uh, um, I wouldn't want to leave him out of my life. He's a good part of it. But that's all I have to say. Besides the fact that I think you're an excellent interviewer. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been so nice in. to have you both yeah. here. Okay. Thank you. All right.